Thank you very much. I'd first like to thank Anja and as well as the IAAC and FITCON for inviting me here. Uh, my name again is Sam Nugent and I'm from Cornell University. I'm in the Department of Food Science at Cornell University, so we're specifically interested in food safety. Uh, some of us work on biosensors for food safety, uh, different types of biosensors and things that uh, will try to make it easier and faster to competently detect not only pathogens but indicators in food and water samples. So what you see here is what I'll talk about briefly today. Uh, these are, are phages, as Anja mentioned, uh, which we will uh, we'll cover later on. So the evolution of my group, we started off really looking at microfluidics uh, for food safety. Uh, we then moved on a little bit to developing electrode materials uh, for, for electrochemical sensing. Uh, sample preparation is really the bottleneck, though, in food testing. We start off with large samples, say 25 grams of meat, 100 mLs of water, and we have to find a way to reduce that if we want to use most sensors. So sample preparation is one thing that I've been working on quite a bit, ways to, say, extract the bacteria from the sample, knowing that, in this case, if you see leafy greens, that bacteria could be inside the sample, not just on top of the sample. So how can we best uh, extract it from there? And then we've been looking quite a bit on bacteriophage engineering, and that's what my talk is going to be about today. How can we look at this thing here, this virus, which I'll go over, uh, and utilize that to help us detect potential pathogens uh, or indicator organisms? So we're primarily now looking at food and water testing, and, and those two really go hand in hand. Uh, and one thing that we noticed initially is if you look at this, most of you will recognize this as a resource limited setting, a place where you don't have traditional diagnostics that would work to be able to see if this water is safe. Uh, we don't have labs that would very conveniently be able to tell us that. So we have to make certain uh, changes to the assays we can use. There's a lot of constraints such as cost, ease of use, uh, and robustness you would have to use in remote settings. Uh, so we realize that is not too different from some settings we see here in the United States. This is a farm uh, in the United States. This is a farm growing some kind of leafy green here. Uh, again, farms cannot afford expensive diagnostics. They, cannot, uh, they don't have highly trained personnel to be able to use the equipment. Uh, and of course, it has to be fairly robust as far as they don't have a very uh, set up lab on this farm to, to be able to do their diagnostics. Something to consider here is we have about 50% of our outbreaks in the United States happening from produce. So when people think of outbreaks, they are typically thinking of things like meat uh, or even milk, which is not really the thing we're most concerned about typically. Uh, it's produce because we eat these things raw. So they don't have a kill step. And so they very often are implicated in outbreaks. In fact, of, that, of the produce that is causing outbreaks, the majority of that is just leafy greens things like spinach and lettuce, uh, which are, again, they can have internalized bacteria and cause a problem. So we see here they're, they're irrigating uh, spring water on this produce here. So the FDA has recognized that water is a very uh, significant source of contamination. Uh, so if you've heard of the Food Safety Modernization Act, part of that is really looking at water as it, that source of contamination. How can we validate that water and make sure the water we're spraying on produce is actually going to be safe. So we not only have irrigation water spraying on, but after we've harvested, we're rinsing that produce with water. So any of those steps we're adding contamination, uh, we're causing a problem. So we're now supposed to test this water, according to the FISMA, uh, periodically to make sure that it has low counts of, in this case, generic E. coli. So they want to make sure that we start off with 100 mLs. We want to see if there's 100 or any generic E. coli in there. And depending on the use, whether it's irrigation or rinse water, you're allowed a certain amount of E. coli. Uh, in the case of uh, rinse water, zero. So let's look at the current method that farmers are using to do this. Let's say you have your irrigation source, you're supposed to test it. You're going to take 100 mLs of that. You're going to mail it out. They're going to do what's called an MPN to see how much uh, generic E. coli is in there. A few days later, you're going to get back your results and say, basically should not have used that water, right? Because you're using the irrigation water as you need it. So that doesn't really help too much. 
In fact, uh, if you're in the case of produce, that food may have already been harvested and sold by the time you get your, uh, and consumed by the time you get your results. So we need to find a way to get faster results, and one of the best ways to do it is possibly on location. Right now, small farms are exempt from some of these laws, but one thing we're seeing is a push from the retailer, whether it's Wegmans or, uh, or Whole Foods or somebody, who might start implementing their own requirements uh, for, for safety testing. So if we look at the water sample, what of course we're looking for is generic E. coli. This is an indicator, right? So generic E. coli doesn't necessarily mean you have pathogens in your food. It means that there was a route where pathogens could have entered. There is some fecal contamination. So this is an E. coli cell, which might be floating around inside of our, our water source. Uh, and ideally, we have some kind of nanobot, and that's why I mean the talk the way it is, uh, that could swim around and tell us if we had E. coli in there. Now, these are all images I grabbed off the web showing different pictures of nanobots. Uh, this is science fiction. This is not going to happen anytime soon. Uh, and, and that's just being realistic, but if we could have something that would identify our E. coli and say, let us know whether or not it was there, uh, that would be great. But again, uh, this isn't really going to happen anytime soon. So looking at our E. coli, uh, one thing that's interesting is nature has provided us with some unique tools. And this is the one thing uh, that I'm talking about here is uh, bacteriophages, or just phages. These are viruses that specifically infect bacteria. Uh, they're harmless to humans, uh, but they're all over the planet. And in fact, this the, if you collect them all, it would be the largest biomass on the planet. Uh, you've heard that you have a lot of E. coli on your body, we have a lot more phage on your body than you have uh, or bacteria on your body. Uh, so the, they specifically recognize E. coli, uh, some broad and some not so broad as far as host range. Uh, but they are very unique because they've evolved to be this almost perfect predator of the bacteria. In fact, they even orient as they come close to the surface of the bacteria. Uh, they'll inject their DNA, uh, and that causes replication inside. Uh, then enzymes are expressed where you lyse the bacteria, and you release hundreds to possibly thousands of these phages back into your, your sample, making them kind of a very unique uh, tool for food safety. So we can engineer these phages, uh, and if we look at them, uh, you really have what we call the head component or the capsid. This is where the DNA is contained. You have a tail. This is really the delivery mechanism and recognition mechanism of the phage. Uh, it delivers the DNA into the host. Of these tail fibers, this is the recognition area. So we have these long tail fibers, and then we have these, this distal end. There's about 100 amino acids on here, which really recognize the surface of the E. coli. And again, that could be relatively broad or narrow, and host range is one thing that we are, are currently working on. We also have these other tail fibers here, depending on the type of virus that you're working on. So what happens is you have this infection, all these tail fibers would bind, and then of course we inject our DNA afterwards. And this is what really makes us look at this as a nanobot. Of course, it's not really a nanobot, uh, but as that DNA injects, uh, it's inserting a code into that bacterium. Uh, that DNA is something that we can use to program this particular uh, virus, right? So what we would typically do if we wanted to engineer this phage is we would, say, PCR, amplify the entire genome. We would remove the part we want to engineer and substitute it with a synthetic part of the DNA, or synthetic DNA. Uh, we add a yeast artificial chromosome, uh, and we transform all of this into yeast. Now, yeast is pretty cool because there's a lot of homologous recombination that happens inside there and it starts to assemble our phage again. But it's using this engineered portion of the DNA. If we transform this now into E. coli, we start getting all these new engineered phages coming out of our E. coli. So how can we use this uh, to help us in food safety? So the regulatory requirements call for large sample sizes, like 100 ml of water. So if we think about these phages as being able to bind E. coli very specifically, uh, we can use that to help concentrate our bacteria. 
Looking at phage absorption is highly efficient, so people have modeled how well phages absorb bacteria, and they found with each collision between a phage and a bacterium, you get a binding event. And that doesn't happen with most other recognition elements. They're incredibly efficient. Uh, they end up being irreversible, depending on the tail fiber, and they're fairly robust, and I'll go over that in a minute. Here you can see an E. coli with phages attached to the outside of it. And what are we comparing these to? If we, we did one study, we're going to compare them to antibodies. Uh, which are, if you compare them to phages, relatively expensive. They're, you get more batch-to-batch -batch variation, and we'll see that phages basically will bind more efficiently than these antibodies do. So you might recognize this as immunomagnetic separation, where we have these magnetic beads with antibodies on them, and these would, of course, go into a solution, grab our bacteria, whether it's E. coli or anything else, uh, and be able to magnetically separate it. Uh, so what we want to see in this first case was if we swapped all this with phages, and of course this is not to scale, but if we swapped all these with phages, uh, how efficient would that be? The way we initially did this is really just looking at primary amines on the phage. So this is the phage capsid, which has primary amines, and we can just conjugate this to our, our particles, whether it's nanoparticles or micron scale particles. So in the case, in the beginning, it was a micron scale. So these are our... Um, Magnetic particles, which are about one micron. We coated phage on them, which uh, there are a lot of phages on there. And we're able to separate, this is just the bacterium, and here's us after we've separated the bacteria here. So they're able to separate them pretty efficiently. Uh, we compared them to dino beads, which are commercially available immunomagnetic separation. And we can see if we compare capture efficiency versus the amount of E. coli, this is typical. You would get a decrease like this of your capture efficiency if, as you increase your number of E. coli. Uh, we look at our phages and we said, well, initially that didn't seem that advantageous. That's about the same. Uh, we see a little bit of advantage in the low concentrations where we're typically looking at, but this wasn't good enough. And so we started asking uh, what benefit really is there here? Uh, and when we looked at anything outside of biological conditions, which most food testing is, that's where we saw that the advantage. The antibodies have evolved to work in biological conditions. Phages have evolved to work in many places in the environment. You find them in the ocean, you find them in dirt, you find them everywhere in, in sewage, right? So it's no surprise you see a peak here for capture efficiency on temperature around 37 for dino beads. Phages are a little bit better on the extremes versus the antibodies. The same with pH. So with Donald beads, you expect a uh, maximum pH or maximum capture efficiency around here. And those phages were a little bit better on the extremes again. When you look at salinity, so this is just PBS concentration, uh, the, the dino beads take a nose dive pretty quick. So you see here, we take a quick dive, whereas the phages and pH, and this is a little surprising, are pretty good at the, the temperature or salinity extremes. So they have some advantage, and that's, again, because they've evolved to work in many different situations <laughs> compared to the uh, antibodies. So if we can use these for magnetic separation, of course, there's been a lot of studies that have shown that, shown that nanoparticles will actually be much more efficient at separating than larger scale particles. You increase your surface area, uh, and then you get brownie motion to really move your particle around versus them settling out and having to shake them. Uh, there's a lot of advantages here because of that. There's some disadvantages too. So nanoparticles typically move pretty slow. Right? They don't magnetically separate as quick as the large particles. We're at somewhat of a time constraint because if we're putting these on our phage, we're going to start infection as soon as it binds. And so if the phage isn't separated from the sample within, say, half an hour, we've already started to lyse the, the bacteria, in which case we've lost our, the thing we're trying to look for. Uh, so they're slow because of the same reason we homogenize milk, right? The smaller the particle is, the slower it will move, which is why we homogenize fat particles, because we want them to move slow and prevent creaming in milk. Uh, we want to prevent uh, our particles from moving too slow, uh, which are nanoparticles. So what we had to do is design our own particles. Rather than the traditional iron oxide nanoparticles, which people use, we designed our, uh, our containing cobalt. So whereas this is 50 nanometer iron oxide, 10 nanometer cobalt, 
uh, as a real-time video, you can see what we've been able to do is increase the speed at which these separate. The magnet placed here, uh, and these are bigger, so they should separate faster, but you can see the cobalt actually helps the separation quite a bit. And these are the, the nanoparticles here. So these are about 9 to 10 nanometers on average, these cobalt particles. And we wanted to, of course, uh, be able to functionalize it and keep them stable, so we put a silica shell on top of them. This is just showing that uh, without a magnetic field, they're not magnetic. And this is what we end up with, a core shell nanoparticle, which we can then easily functionalize. Now the problem is when we look at the scale, which would ideally want the nanoparticles to bind here in the capsid, leaving these free to bind. But if we're going to use the method of grabbing primary amines, that becomes an issue. There's plenty of primary amines down here. In fact, there's really a lot because they're trying to bind to a negatively charged bacterial surface. So this would not be an infective phage because these tail fibers can no longer recognize. Ideally, we'd want this. And so we had to think of how, do, how can we get this? And this is where more genetic engineering came into play. We have to genetically engineer this phase so that we can have this instead of binding down here. And we do this by engineering this capsid. Uh, and this was our first strategy where what we did is we took, we engineered the protein uh, on this capsid to express just this sequence of amino acids. Now there is a endogenous enzyme in E. coli which will recognize that sequence and tag biotin on it. And if we can essentially then biotinylate our capsid, we could use streptavidin coated particles to be able to recognize uh, and, and let them bind. So when we do this, we would put our, our nanoparticles, which are coated in streptavidin, our biotinylated phages together, and we would hope as these sit in solution over time, we would get binding directly from the nanoparticle to the capsid of the virus. Uh, and in fact, this is what we saw on average of two particles per uh, per phage, we were able to get these to bind down pretty well. So these are stained uh, phages here, and you can see the core shell nanoparticles. So with this, our goal would be to take a sample, something like uh, a water sample, right? And if we could take this water sample and add our magnetic phages into it, we have all these phages floating around. Some of them would bind here to the E. coli. Uh, there's all this schmutz around there, which is stuff we don't want uh, and want to be able to separate it from. We could magnetically pull these bacteria out of here and leave all the garbage behind. And we saw when we did that, it did separate well. Um, we can aspirate and then use this concentrated amount for our assay. Uh, and so here is a picture of our nanoparticles. It's a TEM, right, of the uh, E. coli here and our nanoparticles, and this has been separated from that solution. Again, this also works if we go with larger particles. Uh, it separates the E. coli just fine as well. So if we wanted to look at this, make a, a comparison of nanoparticles with antibiotic phages on <coughs> nanoparticles and the micron scale uh, complement to that, uh, how would this compare? Now this is, comparing this direction is a little difficult because how do you adjust for say surface area or volume or mass? Uh, so we couldn't make that comparison as directly. Uh, but what we looked at first with phages and, and antibodies, on the nanoparticles we see the phages had a capture efficiency like this with E. coli concentration and the antibodies are somewhat similar and we thought that's kind of strange, these are about the same, but we saw quite an advantage before. And what it turned out to be is for every nanoparticle we put in, they could be completely coated with antibodies. For every nanoparticle we put in here with a phage, you have multiple nanoparticles per phage. So you end up having a lot less discrete elements binding in this side than you had over here, if that makes sense. Uh, we don't have the data here, on, but when we normalize for that, it shows a, a more distinct advantage for the phages. Uh, it's more obvious with the micron scale. Uh, so if we look at the phages here on micron scale particles attached using the genetic engineering, these are uh, again commercially available uh, beads with antibodies on them. Uh, and this is the gold standard, right? This is, is IMS. 
um, we can see we have a distinct advantage over using IMS in these particular conditions, especially. So then if we say we can use magnetic phages to separate the bacteria from a larger sample, the next step would, of course, be how can we use it to rapidly detect the bacteria? During that separation, we've got the phages binding to the E. coli, and it's causing an infection, right? So it will release lots more of the replicated, uh, lots more of the replicated phages. And so what it does, it releases all the guts that's inside here, right? So in other words, we could do some additional engineering, and this is something people have been doing for a while. Uh, if we take then genes here for some kind of recorder probe and insert it into the phage, during that infection, it will make lots of that reporter probe. In fact, what we're, one thing we're working on is upregulating this, downregulating everything else. If we're separating with beads, we don't necessarily need a lot of replicates, a lot more phages coming out. Uh, so this is what we're looking at now. For reporter probes, we've used proteins, uh, proteases, uh, different peptides, uh, but especially enzymes here is where we would get our maximum uh, uh, performance. So here's just an example. So we have bacteriophages here. Uh, what we would essentially do is infect the bacterium. Uh, and in this case, it's, it's been mostly E. coli that we've been working with. Uh, we would have them bind and cause the infection. When we lyse, it would release all of these enzymes out into the, the solution, whether it's a, a buffer or water, right? Because we've been able to then uh, concentrate them. Uh, as these enzymes are separated, of course, uh, more phages are also coming out uh, along with that, uh, but we're able to then use the, the enzyme which comes out and do some kind of reaction to see if it was there or not. Uh, and there's a, because we can pick the enzyme we want to use, there's a lot of things at our disposal. So the enzymes we use, as long as it can be expressed in that host, in other words, if we're working with E. coli, we have to make sure the enzyme can be made in E. coli. Horseradish peroxidase is a little more difficult, but um, things like alkaline phosphatase, luciferase, and uh, uh, <coughs> beta-gal are a lot easier. Phages on particles, then we can start with a magnetic bead, add our phages, take our drinking water, and do our separation down here. We can then add our magnet, happy magnet, and uh, separate out our E. coli and get some kind of reaction. Now in this case, at first, we just want to see how well can we detect the endogenous beta-gal that would be in the E. coli. So this isn't even with the gene added uh, for, for beta-gal into the phage, so we could overexpress. And what we found is this. So depending on the number of hours we actually pre-enriched in this case, because like I said, this is just endogenous, uh, we could see our limit of detection uh, for a color metric assay uh, would change depending on these, this number of hours. Right. So it's also rather specific. These phages can be specific for a particular organism, uh, species of bacteria. So we looked at our control, which had no bacteria at all. We would get this color uh, change, so that's really no color change. Uh, if we had E. coli, we would have our solution turn red. If we had any of these other organisms, and including other Enterobacteriaceae, uh, we would get no color change here. Whereas if we mixed them with E. coli, we would still get our red color here, right, showing that they're fairly specific and we're not getting much signal from these other ones. Now some that are very closely related, some E. coli phages will infect salmonella because the, the two are not really all that different from each other. Right. And a mixture of all of them, all the bacteria down here shows that we also get a positive signal. So it's a good way to pull these bacteria out of the solution, and it's a good way to be able to detect them as well. So here's an example. Before it was color metric. If we take the phages and we add in, in this case, this is still, uh, this was beta-gal still, but we can detect that electrochemically. So we don't necessarily have to use color. We can use electrochemical methods to be able to detect it, where we have this happen over an electrode, uh, and we'd be able to detect uh, the, the binding here. What we've now moved on to also is the, the enzymes are coming out here with a gold binding peptide, which we can then bind onto this electrode and allows us to do even more sensitive uh, detection. 
Uh, here is the results of this happening in this is drinking water, apple juice, and skim milk. Uh, skim milk's one I typically don't like to use for a, a matrix, but uh, it, it shows that uh, it works fairly well, even though it's got a lot of proteins and other things in there that, that could uh, typically cause some interference. So looking at the genes that we added, alkyl phosphatase is one that we've used. We don't use E. coli alkyl phosphatase, we use ones that have been engineered to be much, much more uh, active than E. coli alkyl phosphatase. Uh, and we can insert these genes again, and alkyl phosphatase is kind of nice because there's a lot of ways to be able to detect whether or not it's there. So colorimetric fluorescent, chemiluminescence, and electrochemical. Uh, by using the engineered alkyl phosphatase, it's also active at a much different pH than the E. coli alkyl phosphatase, allowing us to then differentiate whether this is endogenous ALP versus the uh, engineered ALP. So how can we use this now? Uh, one of the things we're looking at is incorporate this with a lateral flow uh, to make it a low cost device. So most of you have, have seen these before, uh, but they're uh, essentially one of the lowest cost uh, diagnostics you can go with, um, not including this uh, cassette here, which adds the cost of it quite a bit uh, compared to just the strip. But how can we use this? So if we look at our same circle of life as far as the phages are considered here, uh, we can then make either enzymes or proteins, which can then be detected on this uh, strip here. Right, so we can make these at, at really, really large numbers uh, during the infection. Here's an example. So if we take our uh, BCIP and NBT, so these will precipitate after reacting with the alkyl phosphatase. We have immobilized our alkyl phosphatase on the strip using antibodies. As our solution moves up, the alkyl phosphatase is immobilized then, continues moving. We then add our uh, precipitating dye. As it flows up, it will show that we have uh, that alkyl phosphatase on this strip. And we'll make a very, very dark line here. Uh, kind of purplish, although it's not showing there. So this is, shows just another way we can integrate the phage assay into another type of uh, uh, transduction method using the lateral flow. Another thing that's fairly interesting with the phages, uh, which I didn't mention, is they only infect viable bacteria. They're using the bacteria's machinery to be able to make the enzyme make more of itself. If that bacteria is not viable, if the bacterium had been uh, um, killed by heat or chlorine or something like that, it can't make those enzymes. So we can then use that principle to then see if our, our organisms are antibiotic resistant. So if I take this, uh, these lab strains of E. coli, uh, this is an experiment we did where this one is ampicillin resistant, this BL21 is susceptible to ampicillin, and we plate them on the 96 well plate. So of course these are all resistant, these are susceptible, and for these we add ampicillin, no ampicillin, ampicillin, and no ampicillin. Uh, we can then let that grow with our phage and with a color indicator. All right, so if bacteria could grow, this would turn yellow, right, because we would have a phage infection, and then that would produce enzyme, and then produce a color change. If the bacteria couldn't grow because they were susceptible, you would get this, where it would just be blank, right? You wouldn't get any, any enzymatic change. Uh, so you'd expect this over here, right? Since these, this is resistant, it doesn't care whether or not there's ampicillin. Uh, this one over here uh, can only grow if there's no ampicillin, right? Uh, and in fact, that is what we saw. So in a very rapid way, we can phenotypically determine if this was resistant. Now, phenotypic is really the better method to determine resistance because if you're looking for specific DNA for resistance, well, that can change quite a bit over time. So going by phenotype is the more uh, reliable way to know if, whether or not it can grow in the presence of these antibiotics. So uh, looking at uh, where we're going from now, we, we really realize that sample prep is the key here. How can we clean up this sample and add uh, a lot of, um, add a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, unique steps to, to this to be able to make it easier to do this, right? How can we make it uh, faster and lower cost? Uh, phages can be used well for separation. They bind extremely efficiently. And phages uh, for detection, of course, uh, 
works pretty well. We use genetic engineering, uh, but what we're headed is increasing expression of our enzyme, increase the activity of our enzyme, so we're doing some enzyme engineering as well, custom reporter probes, and engineering the host range in which these enzymes or the phages will bind to. So can we make it more broad, less broad, uh, so we can just target the specific bacteria we want. And uh, I'd like to thank, of course, my lab, the funding agencies. Uh, this is a joint lab between my, myself and my wife, which uh, we have here at Cornell in the Department of Food Science. <laughs>